The president announced this past Veterans Day a strategy to identify and treat health issues in veterans that developed from toxic exposures on the front lines. That includes environmental hazards from burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. Joining me is Dennis McDonough. He is the Secretary of the v Department of Veterans Affairs. Secretary McDonough, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. This is not a new issue. Between 2007 and 2018, uh, the VA received over 11,000 claims related to burn pit exposures. 80% were denied. What took so long for this to become a priority? Uh, look, I might dispute uh, the numbers a little bit there. I think we have a different calculation of how many were denied, but uh, uh, no sense looking back on this. Uh, and fact is, I'm not in a good position to determine why uh, it wasn't a particular priority earlier. Here's why it's a priority for President Biden, and this is, here's why he thought it was really important to make this announcement in uh, November on Veterans Day, which is that we've been now at war uh, in that region from the uh, Somalia in the southwest all the way up to Uzbekistan in the northeast uh, for 30 years. Um, now that's winding down, of course, but millions of our people, men and women, have been exposed during that time, and this president is the first in that entire period uh, to uh, make sure certain conditions are presumed to be connected to your service there if you have indeed served there. So he made that announcement actually back in May, sinitis, sinusitis, rhinitis, and asthma. We've seen many claims come in uh, related to those conditions, and we're granting those at a 70% grant, about 70% grant rate right now, and we hope to keep that up. You mentioned those th three conditions. You said it was presumptive, which yep. means now we're going to just presume that it's related instead right. of having to, for a vet to have to prove it. What about cancer? Well, that was the other thing that the president announced uh, back on Veterans Day. He's put us on a timeline to come back to him on rare respiratory cancers uh, for early in 2022 to make sure that we can make a determination about presumptive con uh, connection there as well. We're not in a position at this moment to announce that. I hope here in the next uh, several weeks we'll be in a position to do that. You know, President Biden has said that he thinks burn pits caused his son's cancer. I mean, I could see this being very important to him. Look, it's very important to him. Look, if you know President Biden, you know that he cares deeply about family. Um, and so it is true that Bo's death is obviously very important to him. By the same token, this is not about Bo for President Biden. This is about all the other uh, troopers who have experienced this, all the other family members who have experienced this. I think he's proud of the fact that he's the first president in 30 years to do this. Uh, but he's keeping the pressure on us to get it done. There are 3.5 million vets that served in Iraq and Afghanistan. 86% uh, of them say that they were exposed to burn pits. It's a huge number. I mean, do you have the staff to handle this surge in claims? Well, you know, the, just on the first three conditions that we announced, we anticipate 300,000 claims for those conditions. This is coming on top of a series of additional conditions relating back to uh, Vietnam that Congress has enacted over the course of the last year. So we're, on the sur we're in the midst of a surge of claims. That's why we've gone out to hire uh, just over 2,000 additional people at the Veterans Benefit Administration. Uh, that's the team that will oversee this process. So we're ready for that. We're training those, we're hiring those 2,000. We're getting them trained up and we should be in a position to do that. Most importantly, I hope that we begin to see some progress on questions like automation so that we can actually really uh, increase the speed and efficiency with which uh, we process these claims. Do you have the funding required to the moment we meet do. this? At the moment we do. Um, I'm very worried though that as uh, obviously as your uh, audience is aware, we're currently operating under continuing resolution. If that continuing resolution were extended throughout FY22, uh, our effort to make sure that we are processing timely, process, uh, time, timely processing claims filed would really suffer. So I really hope Congress uh, gets serious about negotiation. Uh, so far, it seems to me the Republicans in the Senate have refused any negotiation. I hope they get serious about negotiation because uh, our ability to process these claims would be hurt significantly by a one-year CR. 
Will you be working with other agencies on this issue of toxic exposure? Uh, we will be, and in fact, we have been. This is a big innovation from the president's plan. Uh, right now, the uh, Domestic Policy Council chairs an interagency team that meets in the White House. Uh, that includes DOD, HHS, Department of Labor. Uh, you know, why include HHS and Department of Labor? Well, HHS oversees uh, the National Institutes of Health, including the Nas National Cancer Institute. Uh, they have important data that will help us make these presumptive claims, uh, make these conditions presumptively c uh, covered. Uh, why Department of Labor? Because OSHA has a lot of really important information about toxic exposure. So, in fact, we are working with the other agencies, and importantly, the president's representative, the, Dem the Democratic Policy, co the Domestic Policy Council, is in the chair driving this process. So we have everybody at the table. We're generating additional science, and importantly, we're on a timeline from the president to meet. So I hope that means all that adds up to. Uh, additional presumptive claims. You touched on this a little bit, uh, the modernization effort that you're going through in the VA. This yes. is a, a big effort. Where does that stand right now? Well, you know, right now we've proven, uh, we've, we're trying to prove this new presumptive model. And that model uh, basically takes a science not from the sole channel of the National Academies of Science, as we traditionally have done, but rather seeks to get additional science from all those agency, agencies I've just listed, as well as other stakeholders. For example, the firefighters have a lot of data about toxic exposure. We want to make sure that we're drawing on all that, all that information to inform these decisions. Uh, we've now proven that with these three conditions. The president has us working to try to prove it as it relates to these rare respiratory cancers early next year and then by summer of next year hopefully we can prove it as it relates to constrictive bronchiolitis. Uh, you say that you know 86 percent of those 3.5 million were exposed to burn pits. I think we all have friends who deployed to that region, who came home and for you know upwards of a year even, even when they were PTing, when they were running, they had you know obstructed breathing. So we want to make sure that we get ahead of this this process, which gives us additional science, additional partners, and doing it on a timeline in a transparent manner. Uh, should help us get that done. I want to ask you about vet suicide because just in 2019 there were over 6,000 vets who took their own life. Um, I know this is a priority for you. Yeah. What are you doing about this issue? Well, yeah, let me just say one thing about the 2019 number. The 2019 number, uh, as high as it was and as heartbreaking as it is, because any single suicide among our veterans is one too many. Um, but the important thing about the 2019 number is, is that it was meaningfully lower um, by several hundred than the year, be prior, the year prior, than 2018. So I think that suggests at least a downturn uh, for the first time in many, many years on those numbers. So I take that as a, uh, a slight glimmer of hope. So what are we doing? We're trying to increase access to mental health care. Currently, if you're a vet and you're struggling, please contact us through the Veteran Crisis Line or at va.gov slash mental health. And if you're in an emergency situation, we will get you seen today. Those veterans who find themselves in an urgent situation, not emergency, uh, but an urgent situation, we're seeing them within two days. Um, but we still struggle, frankly, to get timely access to mental health care over time. And so uh, one of the things we're doing is we're increasing access points. We've seen dramatic expansion of access to mental health care through what we call telehealth. In March 2020, there are about uh, 2,500 telehealth appointments today, March uh, per day. March 2021, 45,000 telehealth appointments a day. That means easier access, lower barrier uh, of entry to access, I think that's a good thing. Second thing we're doing, we're trying to reduce the stigma associated with seeking care. We all do it. It's the right thing to do. As Secretary Austin says, mental health is your health. And so just as we say to the active duty force, we say to our veterans, uh, come get care, nothing to be ashamed of there. Third thing we're doing is we're trying to make sure that we have enough care providers so that vets don't have to wait. Uh, so we're work we'll be working next year with Congress on 
uh, making permanent some of the authorities we have now to hire in a very shortened way during the pandemic healthcare professionals. But the fact is we just have to train more healthcare professionals across the country. Businesses, schools, universities, the military, we at VA, private healthcare providers are fighting for those healthcare providers that we have, we have to grow the pie of those uh, providers. Those are some of the steps we're taking. You know, by far the most common method of suicide among veterans is by firearm. Yes. What are you doing to separate a vet that might have suicidal thoughts from his or her firearm? Excellent question. And so like we're doing, uh, based on based our understanding of uh, this phenomenon and the fact that um, death by suicide using firearms uh, has increased, including tragically, among women veterans over the course of the last years. And knowing, as we do, that those uh, individuals who attempt death by suicide end up completing that action at a much more alarming rate than uh, attempts by other methods. We're seeking to put some distance between that moment, which can be fleeting, but that moment of crisis uh, of suicidal ideation and a firearm. So how are we doing that? One, we're communicating with veterans and their family members were saying don't wait reach out through a public affairs campaign where we say come see us see what uh develop a plan so that when you are in crisis you know who to call you're already in touch with us you know you already have a healthcare provider so don't wait reach out that's step one step two is we're trying to make sure that veterans have access to uh gun locks so that their firearms are safely stored so there is distance between that moment, again, which can be fleeting, but intense, uh, some distance between that moment and the firearm. Through our efforts uh, on this, we've communicated, this is now being communicated uh, on television, through social media, where we've had more than a billion impressions, uh, and directly uh, by individually uh, in earned media like this, uh, we've already seen somewhere north of 10,000 gun locks having gone out to our veterans and their families to again make sure that they can store their firearms safely so that in that moment there's some distance between them and that firearm. You, you touched on this briefly about hiring at the VA. Yes. Uh, what is the Hire Veterans Health Heroes Act? Well the Hire Veterans Health Heroes Act is the president just signed it last week. It's a great new piece of uh, legislation that allows us as a country to do something we've been trying for far too long to do, which is we have uh, experienced, proven professionals who got their training in the military. Uh, medics, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners. There's no reason that they should not be able to take those skills, hard-earned and literally battle-tested, and put them to work in our hospitals, in our communities across the country. So this gives us some new authorities to do that. It comes at precisely the right time, which is a time when we are under a lot of pressure uh, because of the tightening healthcare market. Uh, so we see, for example, our nurses, who have just been unbelievable during the pandemic. They're just absolute heroes. But some of them now can get much more competitive wages in the private sector. So you can't blame them they're lured by that. We gotta make sure that we're more flexible and that we have to make sure that we also bring them in support through some of these authorities. The last thing, let me just say this. That was a bipartisan bill passed by Congress, signed by the president. I was at the signing ceremony, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, I'm really proud of the work that we do with Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill. I hope we can get back to that kind of across the board, uh, but the Hiring Our Health Heroes Act is a really concrete example of that, and it gives us an important new tool. Right. Mr. Secretary, you took uh, office in the middle of a pandemic. Yes. Can you talk about how the VA pivoted to remote work, yeah. telemedicine, and caring for vets? Yeah, let me just say I'm really proud of the work that our, work, uh, that our workforce has undertaken. In fact, I'm um, just routinely blown away by how well they're performing. Uh, just take benefits, we were talking about that a minute ago. Uh, we processed uh, more benefit claims last year uh, in uh, more last year than in any year save one in the history of VA. 
which tells you that even as we've gone to max telework among our VBA professionals, uh, they're continuing to operate at a high degree of productivity. That continues to this day. VHA, you know, our hospitals and clinics did not close. They stayed open, taking care of our vets. Uh, in fact, we saw more veterans d in uh, direct care uh, in the community through telehealth and personally uh, last year than in any year in the history of the VA. And then v not at NCA, at the National Cemeteries Administration, not only did we not close, we expanded to five new facilities. So the work continued, uh, notwithstanding the risk, especially among our healthcare workers, that they took on for themselves and for their families. Importantly, that means that uh, access for our veterans did not suffer um, because our, vet our vets obviously are fighting through, oftentimes with ma many more complex or much more complex healthcare si situations than your average American citizen. They're fighting through some pretty complex challenges, so our people were on board, ready to work, and to do it. And of course, you rolled out the vaccine itself to vets and their families at, at an extraordinary we rate. Were, we were uh, among the very first to provide vaccine. Uh, we provided vaccines at well over, uh, we're up just about four million vets uh, and family members. Uh, today. We're seeing a significant upswing in boosters. Uh, what I say to our vets out there and to your family members, if you have not yet been boosted and you are within six months of either Pfizer um, or if you're in within two months of J&J, uh, &J, make sure that you come in and get your booster. We'll get you scheduled. Not only that, we can get your spouse scheduled. Uh, we can get your uh, children who are caregivers for you scheduled. So please come in and get those boosters. There is a vaccine mandate for all federal employees. Yes. What's your rate at the VA? Yeah, look, I'm really proud of the fact that we at VA were uh, the first federal agency to uh, implement a mandate. And we did that because our frontline providers were pressing me, urging me to do it. We're a clinical organization. We're gonna listen to the clinicians on what we do. Clinicians say, this is the best thing we can do to keep our veterans safe. So I made the decision to impose that mandate. We're at about 90% vaccinated uh, today, which tells you we also have 10% unvaccinated, which is a meaningful number when you have a organization, an agency of 420,000 people. Uh, overwhelmingly, those 10% who have not been vaccinated have asked for a religious exception. We are not going to challenge the legitimacy of religious exceptions. If you file, if you file for one, we will recognize that. However, if you work in a particularly sensitive area, the oncology department, our uh, CLCs, which are our long-term care facilities, uh, if you work in, for example, the ICU or a spinal cord injury unit, we are going to look very hard at how many religious exceptions there are per unit because if we can't provide care with fully vaccinated personnel in those facilities, we owe it to our vets to do so, then we will deny those religious exceptions. Mr. Secretary, in your Senate confirmation hearing, you said this phrase several times, quote, I'm a fighter and I'm relentless. Can you give me an example from the past year where you have fought for vets relentlessly? Well, I'll say one is this, uh, this question of toxic exposure. Uh, you, uh, your question was, why was this not bigger, a bigger priority uh, before now? Again, I can't speak to that. But the president's been very clear to me uh, what he expects. He expects us to get this done. Another is uh, homelessness. In Los Angeles County, we, just outside of our beautiful facility in West LA, in one of the most wealthy neighborhoods in the country, Brentwood, uh, we had a what we called um, Veterans Row. Uh, an encampment of homeless veterans, as many as 50 vets every night. I visited there uh, in October, uh, maybe it was even November. I, when I saw that, I said to myself, we can't let this stand. So we set a goal to make sure that, I guess it was October, but that by October 1st, every veteran on Veterans Row would be into uh, transitional or sustainable housing by November 1st. We hit that goal. We set a separate goal, 500 vets in Los Angeles County into transitional or permanent housing by the holidays. Uh, we're going to meet and far exceed that number. Uh, I won't stop fighting uh, for those vets until they're all in houses. 
Well, Secretary McDonough, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me, Mimi, very much. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.